decide if you want your business to survive, right? It's, it's kind of a mental decision that you make, which is you're going to just stick with it through thick and thin and just by brute force, make it happen. Hi, everyone. It's Kara Golden from The Kara Golden Show, and I am so excited for my next guest. I have not caught up with her for a couple weeks, so we were gabbing for a few minutes even uh, before, or a couple weeks, what am I saying, a couple years. So it was uh, really, really excited to be able to catch up with her. So Marla Beck, who is the CEO and founder of a brand that I would guess you guys have heard of. Uh, It's one of my favorite, favorite, favorite uh, beauty destinations, and it's called Blue Mercury. And it is this incredible company that, again, Marla founded and uh, was a CEO. And she just told me that she stepped down uh, just uh, this week. So by the time this comes out in a couple of weeks, it will be a couple of weeks old, but I'm dying to hear more about that. And Blue Mercury now uh, has over, I don't know if it's 60 stores or? No, we're at almost at 200. 200. That's what I thought. I thought you were even bigger than that. Okay. I guess maybe 60 stores when it was purchased by Macy's, right? Absolutely. Yeah, okay. that's correct. Got it. So, uh, so amazing to have her here. I just, there's so many burning questions along the way and hearing about her journey. And I just know she's one of the smartest entrepreneurs I know and has just gone through this incredible journey that we can all learn from. So welcome. Well, thank you for having me. It's a complete honor. Um, and talk about smart entrepreneurs. Uh, you know, I'm sitting in front of one right now. So thank you. Thank you. That's so, so nice. So you're like, how did this all begin? So you were, you, I mean, did you just wake up and start Blue Mercury or where, what was your background? Yeah. I mean, it never happens like that. Right. So (laughs) I I think I was always a hustler. So I grew up in California. Uh, My dad had never gone to college. Um, He started an insurance agency and a real estate development company when he was in his 20s, and he put me to work in his accounting department when I was in high school. And so I think I was exposed to the guts of business at a pretty young age. And back then, the way you did accounting is you actually did everything by hand and used a calculator. There was no spreadsheets or anything like that. And so it was it was a really strong lesson in sort of how important the cash side of business is. Um, when I went to Berkeley, uh, worked at McKinsey and Company in consulting, um, and then uh, went straight back to grad school, did a joint degree um, at Harvard in public policy and business. So I, I always straddled both worlds. Um, and it was really the beginning of the internet when I was in graduate school. And so a, a super interesting time, an obscure entrepreneur came to campus and was talking to us about the future of e-commerce and only 30 people showed up for his talk. We had just gotten our first email addresses and we didn't even know what to do with them, by the way. Uh, we still, you know, called each other and looked messages on our answering machines. Um, So he's explained this future world of how we were going to buy and sell everything on the internet. And um, it was Jeff Bezos. And his company was only a couple years old. It wasn't even public yet. But it was like a, a crack in the future had opened up to me and sort of, you know, pondering this, um, you know, a lot of entrepreneurs were coming to campus during that time. You know, I started to think about entrepreneurship. And, you know, some people say, well, were you a born entrepreneur? And I say, absolutely not. I was not the kid that had a lemonade stand or, you know, did bake sales or did anything like that. Um, so it wasn't really in my nature. I was always just kind of into business and economics. Um, a professor of mine, actually at the government school, said to me, I see you as an entrepreneur. You should start a company when you graduate and not go back into management consulting. Um, and I think that sort of, you know, piqued my interest. Um, I ended up going into finance for a year after graduate school. He placed me actually in a firm he knew um, in Washington, DC. And then I realized I was in the wrong place. We were doing like 
investments in office products companies, janitorial maintenance firms, electrical contractors. It was just, it was such a contrast from the world I had been exposed to in graduate school, which was really the future of technology. And so uh, I started looking for ideas to bring to e-commerce um, and actually met my future husband um, when I tried to buy his company, which was in janitorial maintenance. Um, and we both decided we wanted to be in e-commerce. So, so, um, so here we start with this idea. We want to be in e-commerce. We don't know what we want to do. We start thinking and brainstorming and had a million stupid ideas. Um, but I was always a beauty junkie. So even growing up in California, it was just a hobby. I knew everything about skincare products. Um, there were a lot of young brands that are created in California. There still are today. Uh, and I realized on the East Coast, these brands didn't exist. And so I thought, well, why not bring beauty products to the internet? And we were one of the first beauty e-commerce companies back in 1999, we launched. Um, we were the first to bring brands like NARS to the internet. The only problem is we were too early. Um, so. Um, nobody was shopping on the internet back then. Um, if you remember the movie, and it's sort of fun to watch today, you've got mail, you would, everybody would dial up on AOL and wait and wait and wait to get online, and it took forever. So it wasn't convenient at all to shop on e-commerce. So it's a great example of good idea way too early. Um, so it, well, and I think it was a category. So I mean, I was at AOL, so I was running the e-commerce and shopping partnerships, and at that time, and so I know that time so well. It was, you know, it was interesting because I have my own Jeff Bezos story back from 1996, where I'm helping him build a bookshelf and at uh, up in his warehouse. And uh, yes, Jeff Bezos does. He did build bookshelves. I'm not sure if he does it anymore. I would imagine if he had to, he would. But it was, uh, I think for me, it was it was a time that it was very, very clear that there were these categories, right? There was flowers, there was um, books, and I think beauty, people were still kind of trying to figure it out. So I totally agree with you. I think that there was a, uh, you know, even I knew uh, Leslie Blodgett at Bear Essentials. Sure. And I mean, that business was tiny. It was, it just was at the, and then she figured out to take it to QVC yeah. and, you know, and she went and built it there and then it came back. And so it is, I think your point about timing though, is just, you can be too early. Yeah. It doesn't mean it's not a, you know, great idea or, um, so where did you, so what did you do during that time? Yeah, I mean so we had raised seed capital pretty easily. Um, it was a little bit like now, which is, you know, people were really excited about new ventures. Mm -hmm. um, the challenge is we didn't quite raise enough to be a dominant internet company. And all of a sudden there were four or five other beauty e-commerce companies that had raised like $20 million each. Um, and so we were the clear sort of sixth player in beauty e-commerce in terms of funding. So we looked around and, um, you know, we thought about the industry. And back then, you could only buy cosmetics at drugstores or department stores. Yeah. There weren't freestanding beauty stores. Mm -hmm. Sephora wasn't here. Uh, Ulta wasn't a thing. And so we decided actually to buy a little gift shop in Georgetown in Washington, D.C. that had a couple beauty brands, but was mainly a gift shop. And we turned that into Blue Mercury's first store. Um, and the response to having a beauty store that was um, open cell where the clients could touch all the products and that the staff were trained in all brands, which it was revolutionary back then because at the department stores, everything was behind glass counters. Um, there were sales associates that were only trained in a single brand. And so to, ha to flip the idea on its head and say, customer first, you walk in and we're gonna help you with whatever you need was revolutionary at the time and really compelling. And honestly, that first store did way more than our digital site for a long time. Um, and because of the success, we just started opening stores up and down the East Coast um, and the stores generated cash flow. Um, so that for a long time funded the internet business. And so we were really so omnichannel so early and trying to figure out how do we disrupt the entire industry, not just one channel of it? Um, and so it was hard though. We almost ran out of money that first year. We had the sleepless nights that almost every entrepreneur has, which is, am I gonna make it? Um, 
And, you know, I used to work in that store um, as the store manager, you know, cleaning shelves, you know, stocking product, uh, ringing the register. And, um, you know, people used to tease me here. I, you know, had all these degrees and was, you know, you know, was highly educated, but then I was a shopkeeper. Um, but that's how you learn is being on the front lines and rolling up your sleeves. Um, so that was some of the best experiences I, I've ever had. Yeah. And you don't forget those no. times either, right? You could still walk into a Blue Mercury store and do that and do the cash register and figure that stuff out. And I think those are the best entrepreneurs. You may not do it every single day, but the fact that you know how to do it, yeah, no, right? And, 100%. Yeah. And be able to figure this stuff out. And I think that, that are, those are, I mean, I, I view you as not only a visionary CEO, but somebody who is willing to get scrappy because you've done most of the roles in this company, too. Yeah. And you've seen the hard days. And how did you get out of those times? And as you know, I just wrote a book and uh, so many of these Love stories it. along the way, very, very similar in so many respects. So I love the fact that you actually, you know, call it a pivot or call it a, you know, what I saw in that story that you just told about figuring out how to, or that it was time to launch a store was that you kind of said, what can we do? Yeah. Right. And during this time, and you didn't shut down the e-commerce business. You just said, it's got to do its thing. And I'm going to go over here for, for now, which I think is such a huge, um, it's just very similar situation, no matter what the industry is for so many entrepreneurs. Yeah, I think what you do at a certain point, and you've experienced this, is you decide if you want your business to survive, right? It's mm -hmm. it's kind of a mental decision that you make, which is mm -hmm. you're going to just stick with it through thick and thin and just by brute force make it happen. Um, because I think... Some entrepreneurs do burn out and they decide to shut their businesses down, whether for money reasons or whatever. Um, but other entrepreneurs, you know, maybe scale back, you know, really far and decide they're going to make it through. And you hear those stories, too. Um, but entrepreneurship is a journey of ups and downs. And even today, 21 years later, it's still a journey of ups and downs. When you are running a company, it's a journey. Um, there's no end point, right? Unless you make the decision that there's an end point. And you're right, we would have called it a pivot, but back then that terminology did not exist. Um, this, you know, which I'm glad it does now because uh, to pivot, is part of being an entrepreneur now, and it makes makes it so that doors open. We were we had a choice. It was either bankruptcy or not, and that doesn't sound as fun as, as a pivot. So I love the word pivot. Um, I love it's a very word. very important word um, that has come into entrepreneurship. Did people say to you? I, I mean, it's it's sort of ironic to think about this now, but the you know the large department stores had their beauty counters. Did people ever say to you, why why do you need a store? I mean, why why would people? I mean, I, those are the doubters, right? And of course, you're you know that those challenging times. I think how how did you deal with those? Yeah. So investors um, have hypotheses about what your business should look like. And so back mm -hmm. in the late 90s, early 2000s, um, people wanted pure play internet companies. They thought that if you did something in the real world, you would devalue your company. And so we mm -hmm. had to go against that philosophy. And I think you know, I grew up in, in California, it's sort of, you know, wild west. I think my dad was entrepreneurial and didn't follow some you know, prescribed path. So I think I really didn't see rules as a barrier. And so when they would say something like that to me, I'd be like, well, that's stupid just to have a reason. You know, there's one reason it should be one way. It doesn't make sense. So I, I think that willingness to break rules um, was an advantage for me. And I really think a lot of entrepreneurs have to be comfortable breaking rules if it makes sense to break rules, right? And that doesn't mean do something illegal, but it means not look at existing structures as, you know, set and fixed, right? Being willing to say, well, you know, it doesn't have to be done that way. 
Totally. And, and that's what innovation is. Yeah. And it was, uh, I had an entrepreneur on the other day and uh, he was, he was mentioning that, you know, he thinks that he should have probably had more business experience before getting in and he probably should have given it to the people with lots more experience. And I, I stopped the uh, recording. I said, hold on a minute. I said, don't discount what you've built because those people that you're saying have more experience, they would have never gotten it as far as you've gotten it. Yeah. And, and it's true. I mean, it's, it's that you're the visionary, you're the one that's pushing, you know, the peanut forward and, and taking those risks. And, and I just think it's, it's a, it's a lot though, because, and it's not like those things, it's not like you don't hear those things. And there's days when it's really hard and you're on the brink of shutting your company down. You're thinking maybe I should, right. And maybe I should listen to those people, but it, it's, it's really that balance of continuing to figure out how to move it forward. Yeah, I think the philosophy has evolved, right? It used to be that venture would say, get your business to a certain point, then you know, hire a CEO because they're gonna know better how to grow it. And I think that philosophy has changed in that um, the DNA of the company and the cult of the company is more important than hiring you know, an experienced manager to be CEO, and instead you hire around you. And I, I'm so glad that that philosophy has changed um, because I think culture um, wins and um, just taking out the founder um, to me just doesn't make sense. Yeah, no, you lose. I I mean, I'm, I'm living proof, right? Yeah. It's, it's, uh, but it does. And I think it's, it's something that I think a lot about too. And I talk a lot about, about picking the right partners and people who are investing in you and do they believe that? Yeah. And, uh, and I, I totally agree. So the e-commerce side, what, what was the year that the e-commerce side really started to kind of pick back up again? Um, you know, probably three or four years later. So what ended up happening was that the stores were great acquisition models for uh, the e-commerce site. So I was a data person from the beginning and all of our stores were linked. And so we were really good at collecting email addresses and all of our client information, even without having a loyalty program. So it was probably the cheapest acquisition tool you could have back then. And so every time we expanded our store account, um, we would get new customers. And so the e-commerce e site started growing with our current customer base after a couple of years when people were really starting to adopt e-commerce. It's gone in waves, right? So, you know, the advent of the iPhone and the adoption of that technology really helped. And then, um, you know, COVID with everybody at home was kind of the next wave, which is we yeah. saw a level of adoption uh, accelerate that we expected, you know, five or 10 years. And so um, I think, you know, adoption cycles for purchasing beauty on the internet, you know, ha have had a couple phases, um, but it was really the store expansion that drove our um, expansion of the e-commerce site um, back then. And how did you feel? Obviously, there were competitors. I mean, Sephora and, and others that cropped up along the way. Did you feel like that just grew your category and, and more, it's an, more than anything? Yeah, so it's an interesting point. So one of Sephora's first 10 stores, they opened next to our very first store in Georgetown. And so we learned how to compete with them really early on. You know, we were panicked at first, um, but then we understood that our what our point of difference was. And, and so we leaned into a strength in skincare. We had spas at every location. We leaned into being, you know, very high advice. Uh, you know, brides could come in and have their makeup done. So, so we had a point of difference. Their real estate strategy was different from ours. So was Ulta. So there were a lot of markets where we had no competition for a very long time. So we didn't do malls. We did freestanding stores. Um, in neighborhoods where our clients lived and worked. And that was really a specific strategy. So we would do urban settings, uh, we would do suburban settings um, and outdoor near maybe Starbucks. And so we had a really differentiated real estate strategy for a long time. And so although there was competition, everybody was expanding in different lanes. Uh, and so um, it really enabled us to grow. Um, so, and then now, you know, everybody's, um, 
has a lot of stores and e-commerce. And so now it's back to sort of what's your merchandising point of difference? What's your, um, what is your service point of difference? And then, uh, you know, we also started creating our own brands. Um, so um, we saw gaps in the market, create our own brands, and then um, we don't sell them outside of Blue Mercury. So it creates stickiness with the consumer. That's awesome. What year was that that you started doing your own? Yeah, so our first brand was 2012. Um, M61 was a clean clinical skincare um, brand. Uh, we we couldn't find a brand in the market that really met our consumers' needs. We had clients coming in saying, I love the natural brands on the market. Um, but they really don't do anything to my skin. They don't make my skin better. And then other clients coming in saying, I love the doctors and dermatologist brands. It was a whole wave of dermatologists launching brands, but they were full of chemicals and toxins that they didn't want in their skincare. So M61 really took this idea of really powerful dermatologist ingredients like vitamin A, vitamin C, what dermatologists are always prescribing, and married that with powerful naturals and about um, 200 ingredients that can't be in, in the brand. And so um, I think, you know, it took off right away because it really filled a gap um, that wasn't being met. And then in 2015, we launched a vegan cosmetics line. Um, so we did not have a vegan cosmetics line in our store. The market was really slow to move into that. Uh, we had a lot of clients that wanted that. Um, so clean, vegan uh, cosmetics that um, get you out the door in 10 minutes or less. So I, it always came from these brands and products come from gaps in the market that we see because we're so in touch with the consumer. We have a really open network where our staff are really comfortable telling us opportunities they see. Um, where it's not a really hier hierarchical company where the ideas come from the top, the ideas come from everywhere. And so we do listening calls with our staff or, um, you know, tour. Um, I love going to the stores and hearing what people like, what's missing. Um, so really sort of a fluid organization in terms of how ideas uh, come about. Do you feel like the, there are more, do you get more insight going into stores versus on online? Do you feel like you're missing what people are? It's an interesting question because I, I I think when I want uh, when I want inspiration for our company for flavors, for example, I end up still going into stores. Yeah, and it's I a want... good it's a good question. So you can look at all the data, and that gives you the science, but the art isn't there. Yeah. There's no nuance to the data, and I find. Whether I pop into a store or now we use Zoom so much with our with our staff, which is thank God for COVID because we're so much more connected to our stores and our staff than we've ever been. Um, I just I just find the energy around how they describe things or you know the conviction or uh, you know just they remember things they w maybe wouldn't remember. And so, yeah, it just that, that one-to-one -one connection or that in-person in connection has an energy that you, you just can't get through a screen. Um, so yes, I find um, more ideas from the field, although um, the video calls um, are amazing for us. We could always do it before, we just didn't, right? Yeah, no, I think that that's so true. So in funding the company early on, it, so did you use angels or was, uh, we had, talked a little bit about venture. We but. had angels in 99 um, seed. Um, it was mainly all sorts of finance people from DC. I just built that network. Um, so managing directors from the Carlisle group, you know, wrote checks. Um, so it was a great community. Um, Steve Case, you know, from AOL wrote a check. Um, so the DC community really funded us up front. Um, because we had physical assets like inventory and stores, we then could go to the debt markets. Um, banks would loan against our inventory. And so we kind of skipped Series A, B and moved straight to private equity. Um, so in 2007, we took big private equity um, from a group called the Invis Group, who um, I adore. And then that was enough to get all the way to a strategic acquisition. So we skipped that middle round because we had a profitable business and because we could get bank debt. Um, and, uh, you know, as we grew, we had more assets to loan against. So people forget the bank debt opportunity. Um, but um, if you have assets that you can loan against, which was inventory for us, um, it's actually a viable option. 
yeah, inventory financing for sure. And, and yeah, that's, that's really super, super, super helpful. So did you feel like, would you do anything different in funding the company? I mean, sort of knowing what you know? It's a great question. I mean, could we have grown more quickly earlier? Probably. Um, but we just made a choice to grow at a reasonable pace so we could maintain the service model. Um, you know, it all worked out. So I can say I wouldn't do anything differently. But um, I think, you know, we probably could have accelerated our store count earlier. That's what I would say, um, more than anything. Um, and was that right or wrong? I don't know. I mean, I think there are business cycles in um, building a business that you have to pay attention to. I mean, we went through 9-11, you know, and the dot-com crash. We went through 07, 08, right? And then now we just went through COVID. And I think, you know, as an entrepreneur, you have to realize there's always going to be those business cycles and timing your capital raises and really thinking about what, what is right for your company is important because there were years where we had taken seed capital and there was no market. There were, VC wasn't investing in businesses in 02, 03. Yeah. It just really dried up. Um, and so we had to build a real business. So you're not always in charge of whether capital is out there for your business. Um, and I think it's important to remember, um, you know, a couple of years ago, uh, people were telling entrepreneurs, you know, to really, you know, go towards profitability, which was, kind of new for some entrepreneur that, that the capital wasn't going to be out there. Um, if, if the economy started to sputter, COVID came, you know, some people could raise money and some couldn't. Uh, and so I think watching those financial cycles is important. Um, and I say as an entrepreneur, you know, you're, you're managing your profit and loss statement and you're also managing your balance sheet and they're not always, in the same um, phase. So you, you have to be aware of the, the financial side um, also and when those capital windows are open for you. That's so true, such great advice. And so when you were building out your board, how did you think about that and what, what you needed to <clears throat> build it out? Did you have a board from the beginning or? Um, so we, our board at the beginning was really all of our seed investors. Um, you know, my husband and I controlled the company. And so we just sort of invited our seed investors to board meetings and whoever came, came and whoever didn't, didn't. Um, so um, we were a little bit ad hoc and they gave great advice. And when we needed expertise, we would just pick up the phone and get expertise. Um, later... Um, when we raised private equity, our PE firm and my, you know was on the board, and then my husband and I were on the board. Um, we we never really went through building a strategic board or a strategic advisory board. Um, I think we were sort of heads down building our business. Um, we had great advice, and I, I felt like we didn't need to actively manage a board. It's different today, I would say, um, in terms of having a board for advice and getting the right people. I think that is really respected um, when you're going out for a capital raise. Um, but I would say don't under you can build a great board, but also don't underestimate the ability to just pick up the phone and call someone for expertise. They don't have to I be agree. on your board to give you great advice. Uh, your board is really for governance um, and making sure um, that you're financially sound and doing the right things. Um, and you can have a great board, but you don't have to have a huge board of advisors. I, you know, I get called all the time to be on someone's board of advisors, you know, and I would say, I'll give you advice. I don't need to be, you know, on a formal board you know, for, for me to give you thing. advice. And so don't, don't underestimate those opportunities for you. You know, it helps to have a warm pass in to have a friend, you know, make an introduction, but you know, you, you can generally get to anyone you need to just by asking friends um, and networking around. Thank God for LinkedIn yeah. now. Yeah. And social now, I mean, it's definitely, I think it's way easier than it was 20 years ago to actually get to somebody. And, and uh, I totally agree. And just what's the worst that can happen? Right. They don't respond. Right. They say get lost, whatever. 
Um, but uh, actually, I, I'll, I'll say that I had one person yesterday that somehow got my phone number and was texting me, and which I found really annoying, actually. <laughs> and uh, and so I, I told them, you know, just let's let's take this to email. But I mean, it was constant. He was asking me all these questions, and anyway. That, that, I think, was a little, it, it was an EQ yeah. thing that, you yeah. know, it's just a, a little much. The flip side is you can't blame them for trying, right? Yeah. No, 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 absolutely. And maybe there's some people that that works with, but I just think it's, it's there's a fine line between uh, being a little too aggressive and actually reaching out to people and, sure. and uh, respecting their uh, their time as well. So I think it's it's an important Link. So, so what? Obviously, we talked about this before. So you're stepping down after how many years now? I mean, this is a big move. Yeah. So I've led the company for 21 years. Um, my husband, who's also the co-founder, left two years ago. Started a new company. Um, you know, I'm an entrepreneur at heart. Um, you know, I, I think you know, launched Blue Mercury, launched you know our two brands within Blue Mercury, um, and I love launching things. And so, uh, you know, want to get back out there in the mix um, and see see what I see what I can do next. Um, so it's bittersweet for me. You know, I have an amazing team. Blue Mercury is ninety three percent women. We've built a phenomenal group, um, and you know, or, or across the country with everything we're doing. Um, so really, really bittersweet, um, but it's time to send Blue Mercury off to college and, um, you know, for me to pursue sort of what's next. So, um, but I do adore the team and I always, I tell my team, I'm never leaving, right? Never really leaving. So, um, you know, uh, it, it's hard, it's hard to, um, transition out of the company that you started. Will there, will your face still be associated with Blue Mercury? Uh, I guess that the the answer is that depends. So um, you know, we'll we'll see sort of what what the move is on the part of the company in terms of keeping me um, involved and active. So, um, but the, you know, I've told the team they can call me anytime. It was interesting. I remember when I I think that's when I first met you. You were just about to get acquired by Macy's, and did you? Did they pretty much let you kind of run your thing? I mean, it seemed like you still had standalone stores. I mean, you were in Macy's, which as well, but did you feel like it, they kept it pretty separate? Yeah, I mean, that was really the goal when we um, uh, joined with Macy's was to keep the DNA of the company and the culture um, while growing aggressively. So we had 60 locations when they acquired us. We're now up to almost 200. Um, but we have been a separate division for all of these years. And I think that enabled us to be creative and innovate, you know, for, for a long time. I mean, I think we launched over 150 products that we created, um, opened a ton of stores, you know, uh, built out our e-commerce function. Um, and so I, I just think we've been able to move at a really fast speed because we have the full weight of their resources and their technology team, which is phenomenal, but also are independent. Um, so I think it was kind of a mag magnificent structure. Um, and I would recommend anyone who sells their company to a big organization or any company that does an acquisition to really think about a structure like this. Um, because, um, you know, I think entrepreneurs don't usually stick with the acquiries for, for a long time. And, you know, Walmart's another example. Mark Lohr was there for a long time mm -hmm. um, because I think the structure enabled him to move fast and be creative. Yeah, no, definitely. It It's, it. you know, it used to be even 20 years ago that it was, you know, you'd get acquired and then they'd say goodbye to the whole team. And now more and more you're seeing that people are integrating and working closely and oftentimes company totally stay separately except for the tools that these yeah. larger companies have and exactly. uh, you yeah you guys are such a great example of that well i absolutely absolutely loved just chatting with you about the build i think it's absolutely incredible what you've done and and uh 
I can't imagine not still thinking about you when I go into Blue Mercury stores. Oh, one other question that I was going to ask. So obviously through the pandemic, I mean, going into a store like uh, Blue Mercury, you know, you can't test the things and, you know, the different makeup applications. Do you think that's going to change? I mean, is the, the, the format going into stores for beauty, do you think that will change? I, I think it's interesting. So I think we pivoted during COVID. We started doing online consultations where our staff can literally teach you online how to do your own makeup. We are also doing that in store where, you know, we teach you in store how to do your own makeup. So instead of us doing it, on you, you do it yourself. Maybe that's a better model. So we moved from, you know, beauty expertise to beauty coaches. And I, I kind of like that better, which is you learn yeah. how to do everything yourself. Um, you know, I miss having someone do my makeup. It's an absolute luxury. Um, and I see it as such now. We'll see what happens. I, I don't think anyone's going to be comfortable having someone else touch their skin or face for a very, very long time. And so the new model of teaching and coaching, I think, will continue for quite some time. Um, and our staff have gotten really good at it. Um, you know, um, can't really try makeup, right? It's hard in store, but, you know, we know how to sanitize it, just like everyone else is sanitizing, you know, their hair salons, the seats you sit in. So I think it'll be a transition uh, and it will continue to evolve just like everything else. Um, it's not going to go back to the way it was. It will be a new normal. Um, but totally. we're I saying need to do that. I need to reach out to my blue mercury stores and do a session. It's, yeah, uh, absolutely. Actually, um, Sarah is on the West coast. You got to go find Sarah. So she's yeah, amazing. So I, ping me and I'll help. ping me and I'll help you find her. Actually, have you guys have you done any uh, parties with uh, with companies? Have you done a, a cultural party where you all do your own makeup and have somebody teaching you? Um, be fun. We do a lot of master classes now, so um, you know tons like that. So um, they're almost every they were every Friday during COVID. I don't know if we changed the day, but um, yeah, I have to talk to you about that because we have a large percentage of women in our company as well. And we're doing for, especially working from home, we're doing a lot of uh, groups, parties, getting people together. Fun. We did, uh, yeah, we did cannoli making. Oh, wow. And uh, Great. pizza making. And we're actually, uh, Helen from Equator Coffee is coming in and talking to us about, you know, building the perfect cup of coffee. Oh, I love that. All on Zoom. I know. And so we're constantly looking. We have a winery coming in and and we send people a kit ahead of time so and then, smart so yeah smart. and and it's real i mean we end up laughing most of the time on these things i mean it's just it's just a lot of fun love so that people, yeah so it's been so anyway i'd love to figure it out if we oh could yeah we're happy to do that yeah it'd be a lot of fun so this is awesome marla so great and good luck with the next venture i'm i'm so thrilled for you Thank and you. uh we'll definitely be watching and see what you end up doing and it's very very exciting and thank you so much everybody for listening to you and uh if uh, I, I'm sure that you loved Marla's episode, give it five stars for sure. And I, I love having successful leaders like Marla and founders, especially. They've got a soft spot in, spot in my heart because especially the ones that can really share lessons along the way that it's not all, uh, you know, it's not a straight line. It doesn't, it, uh, it's definitely not all roses along the way that you have those sleepless nights and uh, big decisions to be made, but you can get through if you just try and figure out where you can take it, right? And, and what you can learn from the journey along the way. And it's a lot of what I talk about in my book, Undaunted, that I just launched too. And hopefully everybody will pick up a copy or Go on to Audible and, and get it and really, really awesome uh, for everybody to be able to, you know, see so many of people's journeys along the way just through this podcast, too. So it's every Monday and Wednesday and uh, hopefully everyone will join us. So thanks, everyone. Thank you so much. 